Um, I thought I, I'm going to give you a little um, book review, and then after that I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I may not have the answer, but there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge here, and the answer may be in this room. So um, that's kind of the plan. Um, first of all, I'll ask, how many of you um, believe that the um, polio was um, mainly uh, wiped out by vaccination? Okay, one, two, few. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a, a common uh, belief, and that's what um, is commonly taught in medical circles. And then I decided, well, maybe I'm gonna look into that a little because I've heard some contrarian um, views. So there's a uh, author, Suzanne Humphreys, who's a, a physician who did a lot of research on the history of vaccinations. And her book is called Dissolving Illusions. And uh, the chapter on polio, I tell you, is quite amazing. Um, if, if you um, are curious enough to read it, uh, Dissolving Illusions, the chapter on polio, um, I, I think you may be stunned at uh, what you learn from there. And it's uh, maybe true of many things. Many things that we believe, it's just because that's what we've been taught. It's not that, what we've really looked at. And also, uh, many times, um, when we go to look, it's very hard to find. Um, in that a lot of history has kind of been warped or erased. Mm -hmm. I think Napoleon uh, said that history is a collection of ap agreed upon lies. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, one of the things about polio is, have any of you heard about the Qatar disaster? Okay. Um, the Qatar disaster, basically a company produced a polio vaccine and um, uh, amazingly, they thought the um, need was so great, they wanted to have this passed through the approval process um, way faster than um, normal. And they made um, warp speed seem very snail-like, and they, they approved it in two hours. <laughs> so, um, and as a result of that, they really didn't look into it very much, and so then they started giving uh, vaccinating like crazy. Well, to make a very long story short, uh, 220,000, 220,000 got polio as a result of the vaccine in that they thought it was a dead virus, but really it wasn't. And 75% uh, of those that got um, polio um, had some permanent effects from that um, vaccine-induced polio. Um, and then in the wisdom of the government, they felt um, putting this out in the public would be a bad idea in that uh, people might distrust the uh, agencies that do the approval. They decided to go ahead and let the other uh, vaccine companies that um, were producing basically similar vaccines with similar profiles. And so they administered uh, millions um, in spite of the knowledge there. So just a little history. You know, that, Maybe things have changed, but maybe not. <laughs> um, so um, at, at this time, I'd like to open it up to if any of you have any burning uh, questions. It doesn't have to be about COVID. And like I say, I may have no clue as to uh, the answer, but maybe someone else will have it. Well, just a question if you know this uh, answer to it, and that is how widespread is the vaccination process for COVID uh, going? It started, do you know how widespread? The vaccination process is going uh, at this time. I, I, I don't know how. Are, are you asking how many people are getting the vaccine now, or or, or scheduled to receive it? Because yeah. there's truckloads of the vaccine being moved around the country. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I will kind of say as a um, sidebar, it, it's interesting. There was a very recent survey that found that 65% um, of the population are either going to delay getting it or are not going to get it at all if they can, which to me is not really the narrative that you might be getting. 31% want it immediately. And uh, so there, there is a lot of diversity of opinion. I, I think um, something that is maybe another misconception is that um, many people, I think, look at the vaccine as something that's going to prevent them from getting COVID. But that's really not how it works. Basically, they put something in our system that stimulates our immune system. It's kind of like a bookmark that uh, if um, something shows up similar, then your immune system is on alert 
to do something about it maybe earlier. Um, really, and this has of course been um, kind of demonized, the hydroxychloroquine um, or uh, Plaquenil, the drug they use as a malarial, anti-malarial, that actually can help prevent you from getting the disease. It prevents the um, virus from entering the cell and the virus has to enter the cell to be able to replicate itself. So um, those, those are very different uh, mechanisms and a, a very recent study on early treatment with hydroxychloroquine showed that there was a, if you treat people before they get in the hospital, you can reduce hospitalizations by 84%. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. And I, I think if that were true and people were, we were to embrace that, I think the problem would be over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Several doctors recommend 24 milligrams of zinc with the hydroxychloroquine as the best procedure. Yeah, yeah, zinc is also a, a good helper. Uh, vitamin D3 is also very important. Yes, also Paul. melatonin. Yeah, with melatonin. Yeah, yeah. And then another study I think that's pertinent uh, to know is they um, came, have come out with a 10 million person study, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty large, um, and they found that. Um, it's extremely, extremely rare for anybody that's asymptomatic to be able to pass it to someone else. And I don't think that's a common uh, narrative either. Yes? Um, they say this is the first, um, they being CDC says this is the first uh, mRNA vaccine that's been approved for widespread use in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and in the world, is there any studies on um, any negative effects or adverse effects? Well, Unfortunately, another thing that is, I think, um, true is that Moderna, who's one of the producers, has never, has been working on this for a long time. And many companies have been working on uh, coronavirus vaccines and mRNA, uh, RNA vaccines uh, for years, but they've never been able to get through the safety studies. And, um, but now because they, I believe because they've altered the, um, bar in terms of what's required, um, things have gotten through and approved. I think one of the largest worries is that um, they, they have something, I think they call it immune priming, where you know the process is they have the RNA go in your body, it produces a protein that's also um, within the virus that they're targeting, and then that primes your immune system to look for that, is the idea. But in their animal studies, some of the studies showed that many animals had a extreme overreaction to the point of death when they were actually exposed to the um, virus. And so there is some concern that that may in fact be um, uh, reproduced in the human trial that's going on now. And um, the problem is that you won't know the result you know, until you're exposed. And so, there's, um, I guess, one way to look at it. For me personally, um, I believe that there are very available, effective treatments to help my immune system that was created incredibly well to, to overcome the problem. Yeah. And so I think um, sensible, um, natural, if possible, supporting your immune system can do absolutely amazing things. But you need to start early. You don't need to wait. Until, you, know, you, you don't wait until you can't breathe and say, "Well, maybe I should do something." <laughs> you know? So, and, and I think the numbers bear out that those. Some people say 65. Those under 60, 65, the uh, risk in terms of death if you get the COVID is less than the risk of getting flu. Okay. So, um, would you want to take a untested, in many ways, vaccine? if your risk is that low. Mm -hmm. Well, if your risk is high, and, and that's probably two or three times the risk of uh, flu if you're over 60, 65, or if you have some of the comorbidities and so forth. Well, if um, you have some available, some um, treatments that can be very effective in supporting your immune system to overcome things, um, maybe the risk is um, not worth it to uh, go forward at this time. But we, we're all different. We have to make our own individual decision. I, I make no claims to uh, have the final word. Uh, unfortunately, we have the final word in another sense, mm -hmm. and um, that's where we have to put our faith. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any 
other questions or comments? Yeah. So since we just can't pull the thing going on, what happened to the other flows that we used to get? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, the CDC really almost has no comment. It's been so low. Um, another thing to look at is, you know, the um, right now we're, we're kind of being told that the numbers are just rocketing. You know, the um, positive test, tests are going way up and um, the uh, you know, hospitalizations were on the edge of um, disaster. Um, we've heard that before. Um, you know, a few months ago, and basically what happened is the hospitals almost went out of business. Um, I've heard that Marshall Hospital says if they have to do what they did again, they're done. Our community hospital's done. So um, th there, you have to kind of balance risk and benefit, but if you look at the graphs of cases, basically you'll see, you know, the um, cases are going like this, and then if you look at deaths, the deaths are pretty much flat lines. So um, they're, they're doing a lot more testing now, and there are a lot more positive tests, but that's also a problem in that the testing itself, um, the PCR test, which is one of the most common tests, um, the false positive um, rate is extremely high. And so where the real numbers are, I don't know, but I think it's maybe a little more accurate to look at the um, deaths and the deaths really haven't been climbing anywhere close to the rate that the cases have been climbing. Yes, Stacy. Uh, I was wondering if you could say why they're doing the nose swabs instead of like a throat or blood or t typically, because yeah. I've never seen that before in, in most tests, like yeah. why they're all of a sudden they're doing like nose swabs. That, well, you know. well, I think that they feel that this, like many upper respiratory viruses, that's where they, um, start out and usually you have about five days once they're in your nasal cavities and everything and some people suggest that you use some spray hypochlorous acid which is like weak bleach it kind of has that taste in your nasal cavities um, to kind of decrease the viral load because the key to overcoming viruses is to treat them early because once you get to a certain number whatever your own magic number is then your immune system has kind of lost that war. And then it's, uh, so, so really the key is to do things early. Whatever your favorite ways are of um, supporting your immune system, as soon as you feel something, do it early. And don't wait, you know, don't wait till tomorrow because the numbers may increase significantly over 24 hours. But I think that it's where thing you can most likely get the samples. But the problem with the PCR test is it's looking for um, a sequence of um, within the genetic code and a, an old coronavirus from a cold can have the same sequence mm -hmm. and they keep on magnifying because it's so there's so little sample in most people they keep on testing and retesting until they get what they feel is a um, result but sometimes they'll rerun it um, 40 times and, and so then the chance of false positives goes way up the inventor of the PCR test has come out and said it was never intended to be used as it's being used, mm. as a diagnosis. Hmm. Yeah. Then why is the news saying that there's people dying like this, increased, it's gone? Are they lying to us? Um, I don't know if I would go so far as lying, but mm -hmm. I think... Um, but I think they're putting everything, every death. It yeah. doesn't matter whether... It's yep. heart attack or cancer, yep. they're saying yep. it's all COVID. Yeah, that, that's a really um, good question. And um, I, I think, once again, if you look at all cause deaths, okay, that's where basically how many people have died this year of any cause, including COVID and so forth, then it becomes less confusing mm -hmm. to kind of sort out, um, you know, what's really happening here. But if you look, because the problem is that um, if there are many, COVID classified deaths. There are those that truly died of COVID. That was their primary cause. There are those that have a positive COVID test and died in an auto accident that were asymptomatic. And then there's everybody in between. Yeah. But if you want to look at what are really happening in numbers, I think if you look at all cause deaths, um, that gets you closer to um, an unfiltered truth. Yeah. So it would be like, um, if we have 5% average heart attacks and all of a sudden 
we look at the new numbers and they say, oh, this year we only had 2%. Yeah. Maybe that 3% was jumbled in there. It, it, exactly. And I think that's what you found in the um, flu. That, you know, I think the flu numbers have been high as, I think, 80,000 deaths. But I think the flu deaths this year are minuscule. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what happened to them? Yeah. Also, I think pneumonia deaths have gone way down. And, and so th there's a lot of things, and, and so I think, uh, unfortunately, for sure, you know, the uh, coronavirus is not a myth by any means, and it, it's a real entity, and some people can really um, affect, you know, in a profound way. But I, I would remind you that if you are willing to um, go out of the box, which is actually do something to support your immune system as soon as you get symptoms, rather than, um, shelter at home until you can't breathe and go to the hospital and uh, hope that uh, something good can happen. I, I like your chances better in the first scenario than the second. Yeah. What about iodine? Iodine um, also um, can be used, um, the Dr. Brownstein from Michigan has treated um, over 120 patients successfully with, I think, vitamins A, C, and E, and nebulized hydrogen peroxide with a drop of iodine in it. And he's had no failures, even in extremely sick people that thought they were gonna die. Yeah. And vitamin D? Yeah, vitamin D for sure, um, for many, many things. Um, but I, I think they're finding that's really critical and really I don't think at where we live right here that you can go out in the sun and get any vitamin D now. You, you won't be able to do so for probably another 30 days because the sun has to be at 45 degrees, I believe, or above to have enough of the um, rays that stimulate your body and make um, vitamin D to be effective. And then the window in the beginning is gonna be very small. It's probably, you have to be out in the sun between like 11.30 and 12.30 to start out with. Then as you know, the, it gets closer to close the summer, your window gets bigger and bigger. So I, I supplement with vitamin D in the winter. And um, for many people that have sleep disturbances, um, it can be because you have a vitamin D deficiency. Um, any other questions? All right, I thank you and um, you have a great Sabbath.